All right, welcome guys to MAC 3761, right? I believe uh, the other guys did attend the midweek class with Eugene, uh, which is, um, that's okay there. All right, so in respect to MAC 3761, guys, um, we need to address a few things, right? Uh, as we're about to start. All right, so in terms of MAC 3761, guys, uh, you're going to find out that uh, you'll be writing tests, right? There's like four tests uh, which you're going to be writing. I think the first one should be somewhere around April, and then the other one comes um, around um, June, right? And then the other one around August, and then the last test will be in September, and then the final exam will come in in October there. All right, so basically uh, that is MAC 3761, all right? So the team that we had last year uh, in respect to MAC, they were actually quite vibrant. Um, we had a good team there, right? Um, but what I can say is in terms of MAC 3761, right, we'll try our best possible to make sure that uh, we also look at almost everything, but they work with assumed knowledge, right? So there's content that you guys did cover uh, second year, right? Which in the content for third year, they do not include them, right? Um, it's unfortunate that last year they did examine second year staff, right? To so the guys who wrote last year. And it was, um, it felt like it was a little bit unfair, unfair right? But um, that is what actually transpired last year, right? There was actually a significant um, number of marks which were actually granted to the second year work there all right but anyways nevertheless um let's look at today's class and then see um how far we can go there all right all right so in terms of the first unit now I want to look at the nature of costs all right so I want to have a look to see what is happening with respect to the nature of cost and all that all right what is happening in terms of this unit all right just to give you an overview of uh, the nature of cost. You know, so you're going to find out now, um, we have different type of costs, right? So these costs, they also behave differently, right? Uh, that is why if you take, for example, um, fixed electricity bill, right? I'm sure you will both um, agree with me that sometimes some companies, they have a fixed electricity bill, they pay a certain amount of electricity every month or in, every year. Right, or it could be rental. Right, some companies they pay a fixed amount of rental for the whole year. You're right, and then after that, uh, you find that sometimes uh, you might have um, a different cost associated with uh, purchase of material. You're right now, what is happening in terms of that? Uh, in today's class, we want to have a look in terms of this so that we have an understanding of. Uh, the behavior of the cost, right? Why is it sometimes the cost of material fluctuates? It's not stable, all right? It varies, and what drives those costs to be are uh, different each and every time, all right? Also, bear in mind that the main objective of a company is to maximize profits, all right? So when you start a business, uh, we both agree that, of course, unless if it is a non-profit organization, but in most circumstances, when you start your business, your main goal is to make profits, All right? So I want to address those issues in today's class uh, so that we can see what is happening there. All right, so the objective, like I mentioned there, right? The main objective of business is to maximize the value of the company. So how do you maximize the value of the company? Uh, that is what you want to have a look at there, All right? So the only way that we can maximize the value of the company is to increase the future cash flows of the company. So when you appoint, I'm sure you guys have seen cases whereby uh, there is a replacement of management. You know, maybe the director or the CEO has been replaced. For example, if you take with respect to ESCOM, right, you learn that uh, they've been replacing the CEO every now and then. What is the goal there? They're saying ESCOM is actually making Losses, right? So, want to be in a situation whereby ESCOM starts to make 
prophets. Now they are saying, okay, can we appoint someone who is in a position to be able to increase the future cash flows of the company? You're right. At the same time, uh, we also need someone who lower the risk of the company. All right, we both agree. So you guys agree with me that in terms of increasing the profits of the company, you need to make sure that you reduce the risk as well of the company. All right. Let's take, for example, uh, some companies. All right. Let's use ESCOM as our case study. Right. Of course, we did not know. Right. I'm sure uh, we both agree we did not know. But there was a time where by electricity, um, I think it was at, in 2022, where the, where the load shedding was at a minimum. Right. And then out of nowhere, we just had boom. Uh, ESCOM has used a certain number of, uh, of diesel. All right, and then there is no more diesel for ESCOM to use. Why? What's happening? They actually increased the risk of the business. All right, they increased the cash flows, but at the same time increasing the risk of the business. So that they burned most of them, um, the fuel there and all that. All right, but anyways, I'm not an expert in the industry. I'm just giving you as an overview. Right, um, I believe the guys who are working there they know better than. Uh, better than whatever I'm saying here. All right. But then, uh, of course, we expect management to make decisions that increase the value. All right. The value of the company, of course. Uh, so we'll be looking at all that. All right. And then also putting in place controlling actions of employees to increase the value. All right. When you start a business, all right. Um, I'm sure you guys agree with me that in most circumstances, whenever there is an increase um, of prices, the strike starts. All right. The labor union uh, starts running and all that. Employees demanding higher salaries and all that. All right. So in organizations, all right, uh, you try your best possible to make sure you increase the value. And at the same time, you're able to control the actions of the employees. All right, by, by controlling actions of employees, what do we mean? We're saying you should be able to probably give a framework to say to the employees, this is what you need to follow uh, in order for you to increase value for the company. You also put controls in place. Um, for example, most companies, right, they have... Um, the turnaround system or the fingerprint system whereby the employees clock in every time they get to work. So it reports what time an employee actually got to work. So in this case, you're trying to increase the value by making sure that employees arrive to work as early as possible. All right. And then um, what is management accounting? All right. Um, so management accounting, guys, it is actually different to financial accounting. All right, so financial accounting is the FHC, which we did earlier on, right? So in terms of FHC, the information for FHC is used by the outsiders, right? I'm sure you have seen uh, some financial statements, right, for different companies, um, especially the ones which are listed on the JSE, you can access their financial information. So today, if you want um, the 2020, all right, financial statements for um, MTN, right, you can actually uh, access it there, all right? So that is with respect to financial. But now today we want to look at management accounting. All right, so what is management accounting? Management accounting now, it involves um, the internal affairs of a business. How are we managing the company? The information for management accounting, we do not see it, all right? Um, external parties are not, do not have access to this information, all right? So management accounting is the process of collecting information uh, that is financial and non-financial to use that information internally, you know? So in this case, we're saying the information is used within the organization and also to support decision making and control. You know? So, and then the next thing now, um, the tools and techniques that are used 
uh, with respect to this, all right? So we need the proper tools and techniques. What are we looking at? I'm sure we both agree that uh, when you're running a company, all right, in order to achieve the best objective, you need to make sure you have the right full stuff. You also have the right full um, material to also use as well, all right? That is why you find that companies that do, that invest in HR, or that invest in the HR department, they always hire better quality employees, right? And then um, with respect to that, of course, you can run through uh, that area there and all that, right? And then let's now look at um, profit calculation, all right? In terms of management accounting, all right, you're going to learn that uh, management accounting, they also do um, the calculations of their own profit, right? So you find that companies, uh, they do the calculation of whether a certain manager or department is making a profit, right? So uh, that's, it's quite important that um, every department also look at it, right? And then we have, um, non-financial um, information, all right? So in terms of management accounting, when you talk about non-financial information, all right, we're always looking at um, there is no legal requirement in respect to non-financial information. Remember we said this is um, internal information. We're using the information for internal purposes. So in terms of this, there's no legal requirement also, you need to make sure that as a company, you do your cost benefit analysis, all right? So in terms of this, you are evaluating if the benefit is more than your cost in respect to the information there. Because the information is designed to meet specific needs, um, it does not focus on the whole organization and all that, all right? So, so with respect to that, all right? If you want to make a decision, all right, this is important now. So if possibly you are sleeping, please wake up, all right? If you want to make a decision in respect to, to a company, there are factors that we consider. And at the same time, there are factors that we, we do not consider. So factors that we consider, we call them relevant information. Factors that we do, do not consider, we call them non-relevant information. Right. So if you want to decide whether to add a product line to a production process, right, is factory rental expense a relevant cost or not? Let's discuss them. Right. You want to add a product line to a production process. Factory rental expense. Excuse me. Do you guys agree with me that whether we take the decision, right, in respect to the product line, or we do not take the decision, we are still going to pay the factory rental expense. We are still going to pay the same amount. So what does it mean? It now means the cost associated with factory rental expense is actually irrelevant when it comes to making a decision on whether to add a product line or not. In other words, by product line, we're saying you want to introduce another product that you want to manufacture in the business. Should you consider, right? Remember, before you introduce a product, you need to assess or evaluate if it is actually going to be profitable. So we are saying, should you include the cost associated with rental in your evaluation? The answer is no. Why? Because whether you take the decision or you do not take the decision, you're still going to pay the same amount of rental. So we call that irrelevant cost in terms of this decision. Right. Now, the next thing now is, I want to decide whether to close the Cape Town factory. Do you guys see that? You want to decide whether to close the Cape Town factory. Is factory rental expense relevant or irrelevant? The answer is it is relevant. 
Why? Because when you close the cap on factory, it means you no longer have the factory rental for cap car. I don't know if you guys are still with me. This is MAC, guys. All right. So let's discuss that. Is there anyone who's lost so far? Because this is where MAC is. Relevant cost and irrelevant cost. So please, guys, is there anyone who feels like they are lost somewhere in terms of decision making? Right. Cool. So if there's no one who's lost, it's fine. Now let's look at control. All right. In terms of business, all right. If you want to hold the factory manager accountable to factories operating performance, all right. Is factory rental expense controllable by? the manager or it is not controllable by the manager. Remember, in terms of companies, companies do performance evaluation of each and every manager. Now, factory rental, we both agree with me that when you're evaluating the performance of a manager, you evaluate them basing on the costs which are within their control as well as the income, which is within their control. Now, factory rental is not within the control of the manager. So when you're evaluating the performance of the manager, you do not include the cost of factory rental. You're right. So that is what we are looking at there. Right. Now, we need to understand the behavior of the cost and how to classify those costs. Right. So now let's look at cost behavior now, right? So in terms of the cost behavior, uh, we now need to, uh, to see what is happening in terms of, of that aspect there. All right, so the first thing now, um, how a cost changes, all right, um, in response to an activity, all right? Sales volume. All right, you need to understand which cost changes uh, when you change your sales volume, All right? And then you need to also understand which cost changes when production volume increases or decreases, All right? You also need to understand which cost change with electricity usage. Also, you need to look at which cost changes in terms of number of setups. Right, this is important. This first unit is very important because you're going to learn now that who will be doing ABT, you know, and then we'll be doing absorption costing, and then we'll be doing uh, marginal costing. All those depend on this study unit. So please guys, make sure that you are with me there. All right, now to understand cost behavior is important to forecasting different potential scenario, projecting future cash flows, creating models, budgets, and making decisions. All right, so this is quite uh, important. All right, so you can run through um, this small example there. All right, you can see what is happening. So in terms of this, you can see we have uh, some cost, right? I'm sure you guys can see that uh, the cost, and then this is activity. So when you increase the activity, right? So in terms of this, maybe you increase the working hours of your of your employees, right? You can see the cost, right? The amount that you are paying them, it also increases there, right? So um, we are going to be touching on that, and then we have what we call fixed cost. All right. So in terms of fixed cost, uh, we have some costs which are fixed at a certain range, all right? And then they change uh, as you go by. All right. So in terms of this, uh, we are going to look at that. So where these costs are still constant, all right? Like here, you can see from um, this point when you produce twenty activities uh, and eight, there you can see 
your cost is at 6,000, 6, right? And then it goes up and so forth. But we call this step cost, but uh, we are going to be discussing that, right? And then the step cost, you know, these ones, uh, they are fixed at a certain range and then they, they increase at a certain range. So there's fixed and then they vary and then they are fixed and then so forth. So we call them the step fixed cost, right? The word step is coming from, I'm sure you guys have seen the steps that you can climb up, right? Up the stairs and so forth. Right. And then let's look at variable cost. Right? So variable cost, uh, they vary, right? Um, with respect to level of activity. So the more you increase the activity, the more cost that you pay. So we call this the variable cost. And then mixed cost. Mixed cost now is a combination of variable cost and fixed cost. This is where it's important. So the guys who wrote last year, they actually gave them a mixed cost. So now uh, they had to split the mixed cost into variable cost and fixed cost there. But anyways, uh, we're going to be looking at that so that we track all those aspects there. All right, cost assignment, all right? So you're going to find now, since we did mention that we have a fixed cost and variable cost, all right? Uh, you're going to learn now that we do trace all right, our cost from a product. Let's take, for example, a loaf of bread. All right. Do you guys agree with me that in a loaf of bread, there is labor cost, all right? There is cost of flour. There is cost of um, yeast, all right? All the ingredients, you name them, that are used to make, um, to make, make bread, all right? They're also included there. So it is also important that are we able to identify the labor cost? Right? Are we able to split the cost that was included in a loaf of bread? Can we determine how much flour, right? the cost of flour, the loaf of bread there? So that is uh, what this module is all about. All right. So not all cost can be traced to an object easily. When you talk about object, we're talking about the final product. All right, like in this case, we are referring to to bread. All right. Now, factory rent cannot be traced to the product or object. Can you trace rental, all right? Maybe if you're renting the factory to manufacture bread. Can you trace the can you trace the cost of the rent? No, you cannot. Why? Because the rental did not add any value to the bread, but you can trust the labor that was used. You know, so you can say we paid 10,000 runs to the guys who manufactured and produced 3,000 loaves of bread. So in this case, which means you're able to determine what is the cost of bread, um, what is the cost of labor per bread? All right, per loaf of bread, you can do that. You can take 10,000 divided by the number of loaves of bread produced. So um, that is how we can go about that. The same applies with electricity, all right? To run the factory, right? So in terms of this, are you able to determine how much electricity was used to manufacture the bread? If you are able to do that, yes, then you can call it a, traceable cost. But if you can't, then uh, you cannot do the allocation there. So you're going to see as we go by now that it's important that we're able to, to do the split between our cost, between fixed cost and variable cost. All right. Now, um, we have what you call direct cost. Guys, direct cost are not always the same as variable cost, all right? Even though direct cost are variable, but they are not always um, the same as variable cost, all right? Direct cost, guys, we can actually trace them to the objects. What are direct cost? Direct cost are those costs 
which are involved in the manufacturing or production of a commodity. For example, labor. We both agree with me that uh, to make bread, we need employees, all right, who mix the yeast. So, of course, there'll be machines, right? These days, things are advanced. Of course, there can be machines which are used to, uh, to mix the, uh, the yeast, right? the flour and all that. But at the same time, there's need for labor as well to make sure that um, they switch on the machine, they uh, insert the rightful quantity of quantities of the dough used to make the bread and all that. So in terms of that, uh, that will be a direct cost because it is traceable to the, to the product that we produce to them. Come on. And then we have indirect cost. Right? Indirect costs are those costs which we cannot trace to the cost object. Like what? Like we've been mentioning about the rental of the factory building. We cannot trace uh, the rental of the factory building to the cost of to the cost of bread. All right. It's difficult there. All right. Um, and then the next thing that we need to look at. Right. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of this aspect, we have um, administration cost. Right. So administration cost. Uh, this cost, um, we cannot trust them as well with the cost of our our product. Them. Right. Marketing cost. These are non-manufacturing cost, and they are also not traceable. The cost of our product. Right. So it's important that we, we understand that indirect costs are not the same as fixed cost. Indirect costs can be fixed or variable. But the idea with respect to indirect costs, we are saying indirect costs are not directly involved in the manufacturing of a product. Right. Let's take, for example, the fact to four men. Right. The fact to four men. We can all agree that the factory foreman, he does the supervising of the product. But is the factory foreman involved in manufacturing of bread? No, the factory foreman does not manufacture bread. All he does is just to give instructions. Can you guys do one, two, three, uh, and so forth? So that is um, the factory foreman. But however, we have some guys now, the manufacturing laborer, who are actually involved Right in the actual, uh, in the actual process. Right. So these guys are the ones who are involved in the day-to-day -day manufacturing of the business. So those are the guys that we can say, okay, because you're involved in the day-to-day -day operations, you can now uh, be classified as um, direct cost. But if you're not directly involved in the operations, then we can say. Um, you are not part of the or um, the direct cost to them. All right. Now let's look now uh, in terms of the indirect costs. We have variable indirect cost. Factory electricity. So electricity, uh, it all depends. All right. Sometimes electricity is fixed. Sometimes electricity is variable. But what is the factor or how do you know? Like we previously explained that if the cost increase as your activity or production level increases, in that case, it is a variable cost. But if your cost does not increase, you know, um, in that case, then your cost is fixed. So if you, when you increase production and the electricity bill still remains the same, then it is a fixed cost. But if you increase electricity and your bill changes, then it is a variable cost. Right. Products are the objects, right? Are the aim is to determine product cost. What do we mean? A product, we are saying bread is what we call object. So the final product is what we call object, right? And then the ingredients right, that you insert to produce the object are the ones that we 
we are classifying as variable, um, fixed, um, and all that. All right. So product, when you see the word object, we're referring to the product that you have actually uh, produced to them. All right. Now let's look at some fixed indirect cost. All right. By indirect cost, we are saying this cost is not traceable to the product, right? It is not a direct cost to the product. For example, electricity, right? Um, or rent. Can we say on a loaf of bread, are we able to trace how much renter was used, was paid in respect to manufacturing of the factory renter? We cannot. Why? Because the rent was not directly involved in the manufacturing of the bread. Yes, you use the roof and all that, but was there any cost that you can say, one loaf of bread will pay the end of one rand? We cannot do that. The renter was, it came in as a fixed rental amount. It was a bulk rental amount. So we are not able to split it into the small components there. All right. So let's look at cost function now. So this is where, uh, it gets a little bit interesting, right? You need to understand uh, that our costs, we classify them into different functions, right? Costs can be classified into there again, according to the purpose of the cost they serve, right? The typical functions of cost, right? Um, in terms of IS2, right? That is inventory standard. Right, of course, uh, with respect to this, um, we have inventoryable cost. You know? So these costs are the cost which you said, um, traceable cost. We're talking about direct labor. You know? So it's important, guys, when you do your variable cost, you know, it's important uh, that you understand this. So we have inventoryable cost. In terms of this, we can call them product cost. Right, so uh, we can also call them product cost. You are able to trust them on the final product. So we say direct labor. What is direct labor? Direct labor is the amount that was paid to the employees who were directly involved in the manufacturing of a product. For example, when you manufacture bread, the direct labor would be for the employees who were involved in the mixing of the um, ingredients to make the bread. The cost of the HR manager will not be included as a direct labor cost. Why? Because the HR manager was never involved in the manufacturing of, of the bread. All right, let me move on to direct materials. All right, direct materials, uh, we're talking about the material that we actually used to also manufacture the, the bread, the yeast, all right? Uh, the flour, all right? Um, the water, all those components, they form part of direct material because you need to mix them together to come up with the bread. Then manufacturing overheads. So sometimes in the exam, they love giving the word manufacturing overheads. So when you see the word manufacturing overheads, always remember that it is made up of two components. You have variable manufacturing overheads and fixed manufacturing overheads. Variable manufacturing overheads, we are discussing about things like if electricity does change as you increase your production, it will form part of your variable manufacturing overheads. All right, and then you have fixed manufacturing overheads. We are talking about maybe fixed manufacturing rental. All right, so if you are renting the the premises there, all right, um, with respect to this, we can discuss in respect to uh, to that part there. All right. Now let's move on now to the next part, all right, so that we're able to see non-inventoryable cost, all right? The non-inventoryable cost. What is happening there is um, the non-inventoryable cost, we're only talking about the selling cost, all right? In terms of the selling cost, we're discussing about 
the cost to locate a buyer. You know, maybe you did transport the goods to the buyer, the marketing cost, you know, those items, um, we call them the, uh, the selling cost. And then we have the general cost. You know, so the general cost, if there's any form of cost uh, which was involved, maybe it's, for example, uh, it is a cost associated with uh, the factory foreman. All right? Remember the foreman, like we said earlier on, is not involved in the, uh, the foreman is not involved in the manufacturing. All he does is just to make directions. So the, the salary there, we include it it has an inventoryable cost, right? We cannot trace it to the final product. And then we have administrative cost. These are the cost of the HR managers, the HR staff, or the supporting guys there. We call them the administrative cost. Right, let's look at um, period and product cost, all right? Uh, product cost, all right, so in terms of this, um, the product cost, we're talking about cost, which I, which can be traced into the product. Right? Like um, in the previous slide that we just did, we spoke about a direct material, direct, um, direct labor, right? Those are a type of cost which you can actually trace to the product, the makeup, what we call product cost. So we're talking about purchase cost of material. And then we're talking about conversion cost. When you talk about conversion cost, we're looking at the cost involved in working out the material, all right? So labor, all right, which involved mixing the material, all right? Cost of getting inventory to its present location and condition, all right? We're talking about the transport cost. And then, um, Period cost, all right? So period cost, these ones we do not, they're not involved, right? These costs are not involved in manufacturing, but we call them period cost. In the previous slide, we, we discussed that these ones, uh, they did form part of the administrative cost, right? Uh, or non-manufacturing cost. So we call them the period cost. These ones you can address on the product, all right? And they were not directly involved with the manufacturing of the product. So we're talking about non-manufacturing cost and then fixed and variable um, or direct and indirect non-manufacturing cost. Right. Always remember, we're going to be looking at variable costing, right? Um, variable costing, right, or marginal costing, we're going to be looking at it. When you are calculating the product cost using variable costing, it only includes variable cost. It does not include fixed cost. But we have absorption costing, which we're going to do. Now, absorption costing, it includes both variable and fixed cost. Now, let's look at cost estimation. Right. Remember, we discussed about mixed cost just now. Right. Whether we said sometimes you find that um, the cost could be mixed between variable cost and fixed cost. So it's important that we do the split of our, our cost to them. Right. So let's quickly see now, right, with respect to the cost estimation. We want to do a split between our cost. Right, so you can run through uh, those small notes there. So we have different methods that we use to estimate the cost. All right, so uh, in, we have one inspection of accounts, and then two, we have scatter graph method, all right? So this is um, the scatter graph method, and then we have the high low method. And then we have least squares regression method. All right. So in terms of the exam, of course, we can examine you, but the one that is highly examinable is the silo method. All right. The reason being in the MHC, 
exam, we cannot use, for example, this method, you know, which is the uh, the scatter graph method. Of course, what is happening with respect to this? Uh, we are saying where the cost are almost uh, in the same way they give you like the same plots in the same line, that will be your range for variable cost. For, and then the ones which are outside, so you, you use this diagram to estimate your variable cost and all that. But of course, it's a bit difficult. You need the um, those graphs that we used in, in high school, right? With small squares, right? You use, you need that graph to actually use this scatter graph method, which makes it a bit difficult in the exam. We both agree that in your exam, they do not provide that, all right? And then the least squares regression method. There's a long calculation involved with respect to the least squares regression method, right? We have a look on that one, but they'll never examine it in the exam. It's unlikely. I know for second year, sometimes uh, they, 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 they try to, but it's really difficult because one calculation could actually occupy a full page, right? which make it close to impossible to use. But the method that they normally use is the ILO method. All right. Now, let's look at um, this part in terms of the high-low method. All right. What is going on with respect to the high-low method and all that? So high-low method is a method that we use to split right, the mixed cost. Right, so a combination of fixed and variable cost. All right, we split those ones using the, the high-low method. All right. Now, how do you do, how do you go about the high-low method? All right. Um, in terms of the high-low method now, they said there's a linear relationship all right, between our cost. So they use the formula y is equal to mx plus c. All right, that is the formula that we use with respect to, to the ILO method. So Y stands for total cost. M stands for variable cost. X stands for fixed cost. All right? So Y is total cost, M variable cost, X is activity level. Then C is the uh, fixed cost. And then, now let's look at um, how do you split your cost in terms of the high-low method. So with respect to the high-low method now, we need two activities. We need the highest level of activity and the lowest level of activity to do the calculation of the high-low method. Right. So what is happening in terms of this? Your variable cost, all right? is calculated by change in cost. Right? So in terms of this, the change in your highest level of activity. So the total cost for the highest level of activity minus the total cost of your lowest level of activity. So that difference, you divide that by the difference between your lowest level of activity and your highest level of activity. That is what will give you your high low your variable cost. And then fixed cost, how do you work it out from our formula there? We said y is equal to mx plus c. So which means now you then say total cost minus, remember we said your variable cost, which you have worked up there. Say variable cost times activity. That is what will give you your, your fixed cost. All right, so we're going to look at, uh, of course, we'll look at a small example with respect to high-low method there. What are the complexities associated with the high-low method? All right? Fixed cost, they do not increase. Um, fixed cost, they do not increase over time periods. We have factors like inflation, all right, uh, which also uh, do not change over time periods, right? You need to isolate the change due to activity only. We need to remove price effects, 
right? Also, the relevant range is important when you're dealing with the high log nine third. You know, what points you use might be based on the same fixed cost level. You know, so these are the points. So if it so happened that they ask you for some complexities associated with the high low, give them this. Look for capacity changes or indicators of fixed cost changing. Pick the highest and lowest level output levels within the relevant level. Now let's look at this simple example. All right, so we're going to end after today's class. We're also going to end here. High low cost estimation. All right, so output and electricity cost for the past 12 months, highest and lowest activity levels has been extracted below. Lowest activity level, so production volume with 20,000, electricity cost 32,000. Highest activity level with 35,000 and electricity with 50,000. So what happens in the exam, they can give you, um, they, they won't mention, Right, they won't state to you which one is the highest and which one is the lowest. Right? This was just a simple example. So you have when you're given different activity levels and the total cost, you have to choose the highest level and the lowest level of activity. Right, so your calculation now, so for variable cost, you then take, remember we said the difference in cost. So you take 50,000 minus 32. All right, so change in cost divided by change in activity. So 50 minus 32, you divide that by 35 minus 20. So this is what will give you your variable cost per unit. All right, so once you have your variable cost per unit, you're not able to calculate your fixed cost. Now, what did we say about fixed cost? We said it's total cost. So you choose from any activity level. Right, that you have, you can choose 32,000 or you can choose 50,000. Remember we said total cost. So you choose any level. So here we chose 50,000. So 50,000, right, uh, which is our total cost is equal to, um, so we can say total cost minus variable cost, it gives us fixed cost. So we take 50,000 minus variable cost. How much is variable cost? Variable cost is, 1.2 per unit. How many units do we have? We have 35. So it's 1.2 times 35,000, right? So 50,000 minus 35,000 times 1.2 gives us 8,000. So this is what will give us our fixed cost. So um, in terms of this area, that is how you come up with your um, your fixed cost. So you've done a split between your highest activity, uh, your, your fixed cost and variable cost using the high law method. All right. Any questions, guys, before we close? So in the next class, I uh, will look at, uh, at some examples, all right, um, where I want to discuss now in terms of uh, some examples to see how the high law method works and so forth. Like I mentioned earlier on, the guys who wrote in October last year, they were examined on the high-low method. Unfortunately, the guys were not able to pick them up, all right? Maybe it was because high-low was done in the first semester, I don't know. But it's important that we always remember that this information will need it even in October as well. All right, any questions, guys, before we close? Right, cool guys. So if there are no questions, I'll see you guys next week. All right. Um, as we go by, the class will be getting longer and longer. I know today was our first class and all of that, uh, but this is the notes that we have in respect to our first class there. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, Ian. Bye. Bye, Ian. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys.